The devil and Mr. Hitler are trying to make a team. The devil and Mr. Hitler are too bashful to be seen. The devil has horns so long and sharp and Hitler is a fiend. The devil and Mr. Hitler are trying to make a team. The devil and Mr. Hitler are trying to make a date. The devil and Mr. Hitler, they are both just like a snake. They've invaded other countries and they fill them full of hate. And now they think that they can come to our United States. The devil and Mr. Hitler's getting weaker all the time. The devil and Mr. Hitler say they haven't got a dime. They needed another partner, so they called on the Japs. Now we can very truly say that they're a bunch of saps. The devil and Mr. Hitler are trying to make a team. The devil and Mr. Hitler are just a lot of steam. Now where is Mussolini? Was he drafted in the Reich? Just like a great big bulldog that never, never bites. The devil and Mr. Hitler are now eating hay. The devil and Mr. Hitler, because they have to pay. They picked and fought our neighbors, and I'm here to say, we kicked the devils in their pants and sent them on their way. The devil and Mr. Hitler are trying to make a team. The devil and Mr. Hitler, they have worries now, it seems. They thought the Russians couldn't fight, they take them off the map. The Russians now have cornered them just like a bunch of rats. Now here's to General MacArthur and his fighting men. The way they keep the Japs a-running seems to never end. Now when they see them coming round on land, air and sea, the way that they can blast them out is good enough for me. The devil and Mr. Hitler have nothing now to say. They're riding in the rumble seat, now it's the USA. We'll keep our flag a-waving and we'll keep our spirits high. We'll clean out all the axis in the sweet by and by. The Japs, the dirty little Japs, are trying to get a start. But when our boys get over there, we'll take them all apart. We'll catch them by the heels, throw them in the rising sun. But the sun will be a setting for them, no good son of a gun. Now here is just a warning, you yellow-livered Japs. We're going to drop a world of bombs right in your silly laps. It'll take a hundred years or more to find your native land. And that's the way we feel about the Axis and Japan. Dog William 7 from Roger Sale 2. Dog William 7 from Roger Sale 2. Go ahead. Roger Sale 2 from Dog William 7. One battleship Legato class, two cruisers, five destroyers, sighted latitude 20 degrees, 15 minutes, longitude 140 degrees, 25 minutes, course 121, speed 20 knots, Scott planes observed clearing cruisers at 1350. And remaining in contact, and by. The four major networks present your air forces Army, Navy, Marine, and Coast Guard. Written by Ronald McDougall and starring Lieutenant James Stewart, Army Air Forces. This is war. Hello. Hello. 15th Bombardment Group. Don't be alert. Bomb load, 1,100 pounders. Got that? Following report received from the clear. One battleship, Nagato class. Two cruisers. Five destroyers. Sighted. And now it begins. The picture begins to focus. The clay takes shape. A girl in an ex-linoleum factory in Pittsburgh loaded the bomb that'll do the job. 
A bookkeeper in Milwaukee with two children exaggerated his income on his tax return so he could pay his share in the plane. A woman in Sagatok, Michigan, had a son 23 years ago, and so there's someone to fly the bomber. Yeah. Yep, the picture begins to oh, Hello, give me weather service. Hello, bombardment call. Hello, chart room. Get me all available shots in the area DOL. Yeah, yeah. Now it begins. All the intricate procedures of putting a hole in an enemy battleship large enough to let water in faster than it can be pumped out. It's not easy, this. Enemy ships aren't made into parking lots for seaweed by the efforts of only one man. A dozen men, a thousand men. It takes the mass efforts of 135 million people to sink enemy ships, destroy enemy troops, obliterate the enemy himself. It takes kids saving pennies for defense stamps. It takes all kinds of work from all kinds of people. And now, it really begins. Order issued from Bomber Command to 15th Bombardment Group. Enemy battleship supported by two cruisers, five destroyers, sighted latitude 20 degrees, 15 minutes, longitude 140 degrees, 25 minutes, course 121, speed 20 knots. We'll proceed to destroy hostile craft during aerodrome immediately. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, oh, gentlemen, <clears throat> combat orders, please gather around the map and take notes. Now, you're familiar with the situation and our target. First squadron will form the leading element of the group formation. The 91st squadron will form the second element. And the third squadron will form the rear element. The group assembly will be over H at 5,000 feet. Wedge formation at 1430. They know all this already, these pilots, bombardiers, navigators, radio men, gunners. They've been on the alert. They've been sitting around all morning waiting for just this kind of a target. Their bomb racks are already loaded with 1,100 pounders. The ground crews have already warmed up the motors. But these men must work as a team. And this is their skull practice. Enemy ships aren't knocked off by the pilot who flies the plane or the navigator who guides it or the radio man or the gunners or even the bombardier who presses the button that drops the bomb. If the ship is sunk, it will be sunk by teamwork. The combined efforts of all five men who form the combat crew. Now let's hear from the weatherman. Each of you has our regular six-hour forecast. You'll find it substantially correct. Upper air velocity is subject to change of course, but for the most part, you'll find conditions excellent. Um, right about this area here, you'll find plenty of low-hanging clouds, which should give you excellent cover. Um, that's all for me. Well, fellas, we've got a nice one. Let's make the most of it. You're carrying 1,100 pounders, and this target requires precision bombing. No trailing them out like confetti, please. <laughs> now, when you reach the objective, pick out your target and let them have it. And scram the hell out of there. It is now 1412. Check your watches. Now, if there are no further questions, then that's all. Let's go. That's all he said. There's more to it, much more. The military pilot's supposed to be kind of glamorous. Well, the good ones aren't. This is a business with them. They don't think much about killing or being killed. It's like this. They have a plane to fly, an objective to destroy. They either destroy it or get destroyed. Now, that sounds simple. But the mathematical science of busting things is a process that would give Einstein a headache. Now... Now, let, let's, let's see how this business of flying is built up into a going concern. Now, first of all, you get the men. Best men that the country has, and you've got a lot of them. They're citizens, ordinary guys in ordinary times. But this is war. And they're taking on new responsibilities. All will raise their right hands and swear up to me. I do solemnly swear... I do swear. I will support and defend. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I will bear true faith and, and sworn in. With the same. It's a pretty inspiring ceremony. 
It's sort of I like to getting married. Completely. You're nervous and your hands sweat and you wonder if you're good enough. Yeah, yeah it's, it's sort of like getting married. But there isn't any honeymoon. Oh, no, it's just work. Ten hours a day, six days a week. And on Sundays, you go to chapel and then back to the barracks and study some more. On which I'm about to enter? On which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Ah, well, it's a couple of weeks before you even get a chance to climb into a plane. You learn the customs and procedures of command, the traditions of the service, and then one day you walk out on the field with your heart in your hand and climb into a yellow trainer that flies 80 miles an hour. Well, no, that's pretty fast at first, but after a couple of days, it feels like you're flying your front porch. And then you get instrument flying. And then one day you climb into a basic trainer, 140 miles an hour. Well, you're getting up there. Then after that, you go to advanced, and then you specialize. Pursuit, attack, attack bomber, heavy bomber service, whatever you're best fitted for. And that's only the beginning. Now you've got to learn to work as one man on a team. And you meet your teammates. They've been going to school, too. Other parts of the country, probably. And they've been learning things, too. Well, let's say Bombardier Smith... Now, what are the duties of a bombardier? The aviation cadet who is trained as a bombardier will study the theory and practice of bombing. Uh Uh-huh. Well, for instance... In bombing, trail is the horizontal difference and distance between the theoretical vacuum, trajectory, and the actual trajectory, while cross-trail is a component of this difference due to the magnitude and direction of the wind. Ah, I'll take your word for it. Now, Now, bomber pilot Smith, what are your duties? A pilot must be taught to handle the large two- and four-motor bombing planes. The training of the bomber pilot is very specialized. He must be able to know and use the hundred or more flying instruments of a modern bomber. Well, I should think so, but why? It's the pilot's task to conduct the bombing plane in such a way that the bombardier will be able to use his bombs with maximum effectiveness against the military objective. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How about the navigator? What are your duties, Navigator Smith? Well, the navigator of the bombing plane must guide the pilot in determining the location of the plane and the direction in which it should fly to reach a certain objective. Uh Uh-huh. What about the radio man, Smith? I keep in constant touch with the airdrome for further weather reports and orders. Also, it is my duty to operate as a machine gunner during combat with pursuit ships. Uh Uh-huh. How about you? What are your duties, Rear Gunner Smith? Ah, just sit in a fishbowl and try to keep awake. Ah, well, I don't imagine you have much trouble the way you get bounced around back there. Okay. Now, that's the crew of a medium bomber. They're not individual citizens once they get off the ground. They're just handmaidens to a machine. A team. And now they climb into their plane. You know, there's something awful quiet about the inside of a big plane parked on the ground. The members of the crew take their stations quietly, methodically. The pilot and the co-pilot squirm down into their seats side by side at pretty close quarters. Well, of course, you know these things aren't built for comfort. They fasten their safety belts. And then their hands start moving around to switches. Dozens of switches, and they, they know exactly where they all are. They could pick them out blindfolded. There goes the master switch. Now, there goes one of the generators... And now the pilot starts checking. Check cross feed on fuel tanks, wing tanks, both on. Okay. Mixture control, full rich, right. Props, high pitch. Carburetor heat, full cold. Right. Check the radio. Control from William Dog 7. Radio check. Go ahead. William Dog 7 from control. Frequency and modulation, okay. Now, the pilot's checking again. Checks hydraulic pressure. Check, 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 and recheck. You know, this is no box kite these fellows are taking up into the air. This is a complicated engineering miracle with a ton of TNT in its belly. One mistake's just one too many. All right, now the co-pilot's building up pressure with the wobble pump. Now he's priming the engine. The pilot's hand goes up to the starter switch. Clear! Clear! There she is. Not very quiet now. And that's just half of it. There's another 1,500 horsepower sticking out of the other wing. There she goes. Now the radio again. Control from William Dog 7. Ready to taxi out and take off. Go ahead. William Dog 7, from control. You are prepared to taxi out. 
taxi out and take off north-south runway. And now the big thing sort of rolls out over the rough ground. And the transparent knows the bombardiers uncovering the bomb site. The radio man's checking the bomber's telephone system. In the rear turret, the gunner's settling down behind his machine gun. Ah, this is business. You know, there's a lot of stuff has gone into this plane. Three or four tons of aluminum, 30,000 parts, a couple of hundred thousand rivets, and a lot of work by a lot of people. And not to mention money. Well, these bombers cost what is known as a pretty penny. A lot of people had to stay up late nights around March 15th, sweating all the while so this bomber could be built, and so it could taxi out the runway that leads to a rendezvous with the enemy. A lot of brains are represented in this bomber, too. The design engineers and the stress engineers and the inventors of the self-sealing gas tanks and the bomb sites and the bomb releases. A lot of brains, a lot of labors there, hard labor, day and night. A lot of courage in the background, too. The manufacturer who stuck his business neck out a mile by designing and building this kind of plane before anybody wanted it. And the test pilot who worked out the bugs with his life as a down payment on mistakes. Yeah, a lot of stuff in this plane... And it all means something. It all starts to add up when the plane takes off. Hello, radio. What time take off? Off at 14.22. Check stations. Rear gunner. Yes, sir. Bombardier, can you hear me? Like I was in your lap, Chief. Maybe you will be before we get back. Radio. Yes, sir. Co-pilot. I wonder what Gypsy Rose Lee is doing now. Taking a walk, probably. <laughs> Navigator. Yes, sir. Compass heading 22. Correction after I get the drift. Okay. We're on our way. Yeah. They're on the way. All over the world, American planes are on the way. You see, the total activity of our air forces is something more than one raid, one base, one objective. Wherever somebody is fighting or getting ready to fight the Axis, that's where our air forces are. The air forces of the United Nations. Or maybe the plane's made in Baltimore, maybe in Seattle, it doesn't matter where they're made, as long as they get to where the fighting is. Wherever it is, whoever's doing it. Some of these planes travel 13,000 miles for one raid. With them go good American ground crews. Yeah, there are a couple of Dodger fans in Russia right now. 13,000 miles from good old Brooklyn. What to what? Is... Huh? Oh, nothing. Let's get back to work. Now, look, comrade. In English, this is what we call a supercharger. See, with this gadget, a bomber can fly so high that the sound of its motors won't reach the ground. Yes. I'll give you a mechanic the Russian lingo for that, will you? Yes. Comrade, for English, it's called supercharger. The toys to call them a voice mostly dead, that is a call. Da. To shoot motor of the Dodge to the Mili. Da, da. And at a military airport in China. Now, this button controls the retractable landing gear. The retracting mechanism draws the gear up into these wells, and this fairing on the shock absorber strut fits over it and makes it streamlined. Uh, give that to your mechanic, will you? Okay, sir. Uh, e jugen anung li bo le san jin ta tou le ma un jian jia na zhe yin wo shock absorber. Ah. Una ni ne no nam yi man kian ji le du ya nu man ba le ma. Ah, ah. British in Libya. This gadget is for full feathering of the propellers. This is a recent improvement on the constant speed and controllable pitch propeller, making it possible to lessen the drag in case of motor failure. I see. That is neat. Absolutely uncanny. Yeah. Yeah. You said it. Uncanny. All over the world, American planes are carrying the fight to the enemy. And with them are American crews to assemble the planes and instruct foreign crews in their operation. In China, Libya, Russia, Iceland, Newfoundland, Australia. Wherever the fighting is, we send the men and the machines to do it. And it takes time, takes planning, takes a lot of help from home. Not somebody to yelp. Why don't we do something? But somebody to help. Now, you take the airplane industry, for instance. A few years ago, there wasn't much of it. A few planes for the airlines here and there. 
Some attempts to make a cheap mass production flivver plane. No money to spend for research or expansion. And then, wham! We need 60,000 planes to be delivered yesterday. (laughs) Well, yesterday, that's kind of soon, even for American industry. I wouldn't be surprised if there was some cussing done here and there before things really got started. And uh, not real heavy cussing, you understand, but words. You see, it, it seems that we American are a nation of peace lovers, a nation of hopers for the best. In European countries, we're spending all their time and money building tank factories and munition plants and bomber plants. Yeah, and we were caught with our plants down. Well, things are different now. I guess it's no military secret that America is more than 50% ahead in aircraft production since December 7th. And our production before Pearl Harbor wasn't bad either. All over the country, aircraft factories are really putting on the heat there. Uh, I, I said, uh, all over the country, aircraft factories are really... One question, seeing how you're one of these aircraft workers we read about. What? How about strength? Will there be any more? How would you like your teeth kicked in? Oh, no, I wouldn't. I just asked you a question. Listen, once and for all, we went out on strike before Pearl Harbor. Maybe after the war's over, we'll go out on strike again. But until it's over, the only thing on my mind is keeping this riveting machine hot enough to light a cigar off of. Okay? Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Now, bombers don't just happen. You don't just say, build me some bombers, and then sit back and wait for the brownies to go ahead and do it. What kind of bombers do you want? Do you want a dive bomber for knocking off gun emplacements or cargo ships? Do you want an attack bomber for machine gunning troops or destroying their mechanized forces with small scatter bombs? Do you want a big patrol bomber that flies along with all the grace and speed of an elephant and just as powerful? What kind of a bomber do you want? And another thing, where are you going to use it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's important, too. That's why we have these captive engines. Engines that don't ever get a chance to fly. No glorious destiny for these babies. They just run their hearts out on a test block. Bring number one engine up to maximum RPM. Ah, a few years ago, an airplane engine like this is... Well, it's kind of impossible. People thought we might have some someday, maybe 20 years or so, maybe more. Yeah, now they're turning them out as fast as they used to turn out automobiles. 1,500 horsepower, 1,850 horsepower, 2,000 horsepower. Now they're making them like they make hotcakes. We'll now test for sub-zero horsepower. Turn on the refrigerators and bring the temperature down to 40 below zero. Gets kind of cold in Norway, in Iceland, in Russia. Some of these motors will be going there. They'll have to be built for the weather conditions they're going to fight in. Which reminds me of something the Nazis say. They say they're planning to build an airplane engine that will develop 2,500 horsepower. That's a lot of horse. The Nazis also say that the new order will bring sweetness and light to Europe. Yeah. Yeah, like the sweetness and light it brought to Poland and a couple of other places. Any other place they haven't visited, as a matter of fact. But never mind that. We're talking about horsepower now. And this is what we can say in the United States. There's no other country in the world that can build 2,500 horsepower motors for airplanes except us. And there's no other country that can build 2,000 horsepower airplane engines in mass production the way we're building them right along. And the reason we can do it is because of our research and our skilled labor and the thousands of tests that we give each motor. And why? So that the only thing the bomber crew has to worry about is dropping the bombs. So that our friends in that bombing plane someplace out in the Pacific will get to where they're going and get back. 
Hey, you, uh, engineer. Yes? Say, uh, we want to rejoin some friends of ours. They're, they're flying a medium bomber out over the Pacific, height about 30,000 feet, I think. Can you help us out here? Well, sure. Bring up number one engine to maximum RPM. Altitude, 30,000 feet. There's the blue Pacific. It's not going to be so Pacific in a few minutes. And there's our bomber. It takes a lot of stuff to build a bomber like this one. A lot more than just metal and wood and fabric. There's sweat involved and tears. Men giving up some of their rights. Business giving up profits. Who wants to make profit on blood? Women crying. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in a bomber like this one. Enough stuff to make it a match for the armor plate on a 35,000-ton enemy battleship. It'll do. It'll do. It's a good plane, and there are good men at the controls. They're getting sort of restless now, maybe a little nervous. They squirm down into their seats, their behinds reaching for solidity against the concussion of anti-aircraft. The rear gunner licks his lips and fingers the triggers of his machine guns. He wonders if he's going to be sick this time. The navigator puts away his calibers and slide rule and takes his station at the turret gun. Bombardier checks his sights close to their objective now. Must be getting close. Keep your eyes open. Let me know if you see anything. There they are. About 15 miles of beam. Okay, this is it. Radio. Contact all flight members and inform control. Enemy sighted. 10 0 Heading southwest. Acknowledge. We'll spar for individual Enemy attack from four directions. How do you want it, Bombardier? Take over. We'll take the big one. Make your run in diagonally. East, west from eastern. Give me a nice long run in. I'll drop this second one right down the funnel. All right, let's go down. Hang on. States. Left one, 30 degrees. This is why you have to sweat around March 15th. This is why you've got to shower down the cash. Level off. This is why you save up pennies to buy defense stamps. This is why you walk to work instead of riding in your car. I right. This is why you woman buy sugar two pounds at a time. This is why there can't be any more strikes until it's over. This is where your profits go, businessman. 135 million people are riding on this bomber. Their honor and their future is cargo. And it's their might that helps the pilot hold it steady against anti-aircraft fire. It's their power that pushes the bombardier's thumb down on the button that releases the bomb. Cigar. Close bomb doors. Bomb doors closed, sir. Those cruiser boys can really shoot. Something tells me that son of doesn't like us. Yep, on the starboard side. Any damage? No, we've got a hole you can stick your head through, but no damage. Well, stay out of the draft. Everybody happy? Bombardier? 
Okay, Chief. Back on the job, navigator? Right. Co-pilot? Okay, here. Radio? Trying to contact me, sir. Good. How about you, rear gunner? You still with us? Yeah, but I don't know why I bothered to eat lunch before we took off. <laughs> what, again? Uh, again. Oh, uh, may I try a few bursts for my gun, sir? Sure. Go ahead if it'll make you feel better. <laughs> for tomorrow. Orders issued by group commander to his staff and squadron commanders at his headquarters. That looks all right. Heard anything from the 5th Bombardment Group? I'm getting a signal now, sir. Roger, sail 2 from William Dog 7. Roger, sail 2 from William Dog 7. Knowledge. William Dog 7 from Roger, sail 2. William Dog 7 from Roger, sail 2. Go ahead. Enemy craft contacted 1455. Enemy craft contacted 1455. Target destroyed. This is war. You have been listening to your Air Forces, starring Lieutenant James Stewart, Army Air Forces, and featuring Frank Albertson as the pilot. The program was written by Ronald McDougall and directed in Hollywood by Glenn Hall Taylor. Lieutenant Howard Nussbaum, Army Air Forces, was associate director. Original music was by Charles Dant. Next week at this same time, the four major networks again unite the resources of American radio to present the ninth in their series of broadcasts for wartime America, Bridge of Ships. This is war. It's really yours, you know. Now, the day after tomorrow is Army Day. Airfields, other than those in strategic military areas, will be open tomorrow and the next day. Now, why don't you visit your Air Forces and get acquainted with the men and the machines that make the Air Force what it is? Well, I'll be seeing you. And keep them flying. <laughs> News what it is news. Your friendly mobile gas and mobile oil dealer brings you latest news and a suggestion to help make your car last longer. The mobile gas news service is on the air. Big nine-inch guns have been pounding the Japanese tom-tom beat of hate on Corregidor tonight, and the Army communique leaves little doubt that the enemy is making a final effort to subdue that gallant fortress of democracy. These guns are mounted on the heights of Bataan, overlooking the Rocky Isle. And the Army admits that in a dawn-to-dusk bombardment, some casualties and damage resulted. Tokyo reports in a propaganda radiogram dated Tuesday, which it now is in Tokyo, that Jap troops have completed mopping up the defenders of the island of Sumatra. Five flights of Japanese bombers, according to Shung King, have raided air drones in China's Kiangsai province, evidently hunting for the American planes that bombed Tokyo on Saturday. However, the news from the Orient is not all negative. Chinese armies have plodded doggedly over the scorched earth of the devastated oil fields in Burma to an important victory. Shung King says they have retaken the key town of Yinanyan and freed several thousand British troops trapped there. Another Chinese column is counterattacking the Japs fiercely on the Satang front. On Burma sectors, a slow retreat by the United Nations is being maintained. From Australia comes reassuring news. General MacArthur and Australian Prime Minister Curtin have agreed allied striking power must be concentrated for offensive action. This is interpreted as meaning just one thing, 
an Allied drive to take the initiative from Japan. Tokyo, by the way, seems jittery and confused over the first direct blow struck by Allied air power at her homeland. From a mass of Nipponese rumors, little that is clear can be gained. But diplomatic reports to Chile established that there was a sizable raid. Ample excuse for the Japs to be hopping around like the proverbial hen on the hot griddle. Japan charges that the invading planes flew off toward China. Washington has nothing to say. The answer for the time being is, could be. The Jap radio, in one spurt of bland reassurance, declared the damage done was negligible, and a little later told of a cabinet meeting to discuss damage and remedial measures. The propaganda spider tangled in its own web, so to speak, and well tangled, too. Japan has ordered a sensational shake-up in the important Military Affairs Bureau, sending Major General Sato to an unrevealed post at the front. His immediate subordinate steps into his shoes. The Tokyo press calls the move one toward reconstructing the military administration. But the post has nothing to do with strategy or military operations. Major General Sato is perhaps going to the front for a military lesson. The war in Europe and Africa centers about future possibilities. Although, by way of timely interest, Hitler's 53rd birthday was duly observed insofar as the British RAF could beat a bad weather handicap. They managed a neat bombardment in the Cherbourg area. Centering the picture of future developments is the French fleet, built to fight Germans, but perhaps doomed to be taken over by them. Pierre Laval, newly installed head at Vichy, has announced he intends active collaboration with Germany. And Admiral Darlau, defense chief, will issue his first order of the day tomorrow. The atmosphere in France is one of suspense tonight. Thirty French hostages were executed at Rouen in reprisal for the recent bombing of a German troop train. A fascist party leader narrowly escaped being bombed to death in Paris last night. How French Navy men would regard serving under German command is still problematical. Meantime, Hitler spent his birthday on the Russian front in the midst of bad news. He received no presents by his own request. Marshal Timoshenko, Red Leader, is getting together a big army of recruits, freshly equipped with American planes to halt the belated Nazi drive. Russian figures on recent battles offer Hitler the following to ponder. Six German vessels sunk in northern waters recently. 1,500 Germans killed on the Central Front in two days. 31 German planes shot down Sunday, with only 13 Soviet planes lost. 1,500 German planes, all told, destroyed during March and the first two weeks of April. Two qualities in sports make champions. Applied power and teamwork. Between fielders on double plays, between runner and interference for touchdowns, between pivot man and forward for baskets. True in sports and true in your car's engine, too. For it's the perfect teamwork between mobile gas and mobile oil that has made them America's favorite gasoline and motor oil team. It's the great teamwork of these two products that gives you flying horsepower. To begin with, they're both fast. Mobile gas starts fast and gives you fast acceleration when you want it. Mobile oil flows fast, is designed to slide in between engine parts before wear can get started. And both of them have plenty of staying power, too. Mobile gas is packed with power for long, thrifty mileage. Mobile oil stands up under terrific punishment and keeps on lubricating, fighting friction and wear. That's why, for flying horsepower, it's best to get both mobile gas and mobile oil at your next sign of the flying red horse. News from the nation's capital. Uncle Sam's coattails were whipping in the breeze today as he went after American industry again to keep it in line with the aims of victory. Three plants of the Brewster Aeronautical Corporation on Long Island were taken over by the Navy because, according to the government, they weren't turning out enough dive bombers and fighter planes, and the administration was dissatisfied with their management. The Navy will relinquish control to private management again when Uncle Sam is satisfied the job is going to be done as the times demand. Two of the nation's biggest steelmakers came under the eagle eye of the Justice Department at the same time. Suits were filed against the Jones and Laughlin and the Carnegie, Illinois Steel Corporation on charges they were delivering low-rated orders or orders with no rating at all, quote, 
to the delay of orders with high preference ratings. The companies deny the charges. Proper use of the nation's manpower is another sizable item in the war program on which Chairman McNutt of the new War Manpower Commission outlined his policy today. He will try to get manpower spread around properly as needed under a volunteer system, but he hinted he will ask for drastic measures to line up the labor supply if the voluntary measures should fail. The commissioner lashed out at labor pirates who were robbing various plants of skilled workers without regard to the essential nature of the work they now have. He cited the example of an aircraft manufacturer hiring away workers from a firm making wings for his own planes, thus tripping over his own shoelaces. Looking toward the wage, tax, and profit situation, President Roosevelt will present his views in a special message to Congress within a week, then to the nation in a fireside chat. Meantime, no congressional action on pending labor regulation will be taken. It is probable that both messages will indicate the administration's plans for halting inflation, which Mr. Roosevelt has been pondering for some weeks. A freezing of all commodity prices, virtual elimination of installment buying, and the voluntary bond purchase plan are expected to emerge as concrete parts of the plans. Some control over wages and profits is also anticipated. It is said the president on the advice of Congress, will not seek new taxes beyond the pending seven and one-half billion dollar revenue bill. There is no official revelation yet as to what information Army Chief of Staff General Marshall and Lend-Lease Coordinator Harry Hopkins brought back from overseas. They conferred with the President for more than two hours today. A beginning has been made towards financial security for servicemen with dependents. A bill introduced by Senator Johnson of Colorado and claiming the approval of the War Department would give a soldier's, Marine's, or sailor's wife $20 monthly with $10 for each child. Smaller benefits would be allowed for parents and other dependent relatives. To help meet the cost, deductions would be made from the pay of the four highest grades of enlisted men, but none would be taken from Army privates, first-class privates and corporals, or similar grades in other services. From the Navy comes word that its great flying ace, Lieutenant Edward H. O'Hare, may get the Congressional Medal of Honor tomorrow from the President. This for his heroism in shooting down six Jap planes in a single dogfight. O'Hare and his buddies knocked down 17 of 18 enemy planes. Blame has been placed by a naval inquiry on the Robbins Dry Dock and Repair Company of New York for gross carelessness and a lack of common sense as responsible for the burning of the French liner Normandy. Suit against the firm was recommended. Also, Father Coughlin's magazine, Social Justice Remains Unmailable. The Postmaster General barred it tonight for utterances branded as seditious. Coughlin's parents, to whom he transferred nominal ownership in 1940, have been subpoenaed to appear before a special grand jury investigating Axis propaganda. And now... News of the nation at large, mostly from Chicago. The Republican National Committee, in session at the Hotel LaSalle in Chicago, has placed the grand old party on record as favoring world cooperation after the war. Supporters of Wendell L. Wilkie, 1940 presidential candidate and titular party leader, consider the policy committee's decision as a victory for Wilkie's anti-isolationist beliefs. He telephoned a statement from New York to the meeting in which he declared that by adopting the Stand for World Cooperation, the committee had adopted principles necessary to survival of the Republican Party and of the nation itself. Senators Taft of Ohio and Brooks of Illinois, both pre-war isolationists, had attempted to get a resolution through endorsing the war effort, but non-committal as to post-war policy. GOP publicity chief Clarence Buddington Kelland, nationally known author, called the final resolution a compromise but Wilkie's followers claim he has strengthened his leadership and gained more than he asked for in the change of policy. The resolution also pledges preservation of the two-party form of government and threatens to oppose administration attempts to inaugurate what it calls unbound economic reforms at home. The Republicans demand that when the upper hand has been gained over our military enemies, the nation shall flatly refuse any peace proposal short of complete victory. Appeasement or compromise are completely ruled out in the policy committee statement. 
Lack of organization has been a weakness of the Democratic War regime, according to the Republican Committee, which recommended that the burden of the war be distributed equally to all classes and that excess profits from the war be eliminated. The committee will adjourn tomorrow. Again, Chicago. Ground has been broken here for another huge war production plant, one of the biggest ever to be built in this area. It will be operated by the Aluminum Company of America for the Defense Plant Corporation and will employ between six and 7,000 workers when construction begins. Mount Carroll, Illinois. First-degree murder charges are to be brought against 12-year-old Billy Geisman, who has admitted that he killed Mr. and Mrs. Clarence Krugjohan because they reproved him and spanked him seven months ago. Next time you're walking down the street and you see a soldier in uniform, try to imagine what you'd answer if he should stop you and say, I've given up my job, my family, my luxuries for the rest of the war. Are you doing everything you can to help me? Are you giving up luxuries to buy United States war bonds and stamps that'll give me what I need to fight? Remember, that soldier knows that even fighting is not enough. He's buying war bonds, too. Old Dobbin, back in the horse and buggy days, never got more loving care than most of us are giving our cars these days. There's a lot of satisfaction in stopping at the sign of the flying red horse and getting your car groomed for the long pull ahead. Dirty or faulty spark plugs, for instance, can waste more than one out of every ten gallons of gasoline. Spark plugs should be cleaned and recapped at least once every 5,000 miles. Better drive in this week and ask your friendly mobile gas or mobile oil dealer to inspect, clean, and regap your spark plugs or replace worn-out plugs. Properly adjusted spark plugs will make your car operate more smoothly, restore lagging power, and they'll actually help you save gasoline. Well, saving gasoline means saving money. So drive in today or tomorrow at the sign of the Flying Red Horse. Tune in again at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning when your mobile gas and mobile oil dealers will bring you the latest news. Remember, as you drive your car or heat your home, oil is ammunition. Use it wisely. And for America's favorite team, mobile gas and mobile oil for your car, mobile heat for your home, stop at your mobile gas and mobile oil dealer's sign of the Flying Red Horse, your sign of friendly service. The next news broadcast over this station will be presented in just 15 minutes. This is the WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. Hello, everybody. This is Station Debunk, the station that debunks war propaganda, war hysteria, war profiteers, and war criminals. We are on the air every night at 8.30 p.m. Central War Time, operating on 7.2 megacycles. We'll start our program in about one minute. 